All right, everyone. I am here with Suchi Saria. Suchi is the founder and CEO of Bayesian Health, the John C. Malone Associate Professor of Computer Science, Statistics, and Health Policy, and the director of the Machine Learning and Healthcare Lab at the Johns Hopkins University. Suchi, welcome to the Twimble AI podcast. Thanks, Sam. The long affiliation that made me very nervous. <laughs> it was quite a mouthful. Uh, but I'm super excited to have you here on the show. This is a, an interview that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. I think uh, I remember seeing one of your very early presentations on machine learning for sepsis. And I this was, how long ago was that work? Um, I've been working on it for over six years now. So I don't know when which presentation you saw, but yeah, it's been a while. That That's awesome. Uh, the podcast has been going strong for five, so it was probably early days for, for both of us. Um, so nonetheless, excited to have you here on the show and would love to start out by having you introduce yourself to our audience, share a bit about your story, and kind of give us a sense for how you came to work at this convergence of machine learning, AI, healthcare, medicine, all these great things. So I grew up in India, in like a tiny little town in India. And um, it just so happens, you know, India is a very nerdy place. It's people are totally encouraged to be engineers and computer science nerds at a young age. And um, I got into computer science very early and actually seemed, got fascinated by AI as a field and just really got lucky and um, trained at a very young age with people who are luminaries in the field, which means got tons of opportunities that were uncharacteristic for someone my age and background. And um, in terms of, uh, for me, actually around 12-ish years ago, 2006, 2007, 8, around then, I was kind of going through an early midlife crisis where I realized a lot of the kinds of ideas we were exploring in AI and machine learning, the applications at the time were advertising or like, you know, uh, personalization on a phone or personalization on a mm -hmm. desktop you know, email foldering. And what that made me think about was, you know, um, like, is that I wanted to sort of do something with more social, immediate social impact. And, um, and that meant I considered everything. And around that time also got introduced to colleagues at uh, Stanford who were um, physicians. So these were like physicians who took care of premature babies these babies are at risk for major complications. Um, and if you can, um, turns out, because they're very, very tiny premature, uh, treating them in a timely way is very important for being able to impact the health outcomes. Like they're much more at risk for declining, deteriorating, had poor, having poor neurodevelopmental outcomes and not surviving if you don't catch them in a timely way. So that was sort of my first introduction actually to uh, moving from just sort of understanding and studying methodological problems in machine learning and AI, broadly applied to like hard, messy time series data sets, to thinking harder about real world applications where we really could make an impact. And, um, you know, that, uh, and healthcare is just really hard. I didn't mm -hmm. realize how hard it is and what I was getting into, but um, <laughs> I really didn't. I've, it's gotten me so many sleepless nights. Um, but yeah, but, you know, it sort of also made me realize like, holy majoli, like there's so much opportunity, but, um, but, you know, it's going to require the right types of efforts to make progress. Um, and, and that's, and that's how I got started and went, kept going down that path and, um, actually have considered the whole nine gamut from like advising companies to, uh, previously being part of early stage companies to now spinning out this company out of Hopkins. But um, you, and to obviously being a professor, faculty, uh, you know, innovating on research and uh, all throughout sort of with one singular focus, which is healthcare is moving from, you know, uh, in 2009, there was the uh, uh, particularly uh, big event that happened, which was the passage of the uh, High Tech Act that made it so that systems mm -hmm. were going from no data to data. Data were now going to be stored electronically at scale across hospitals and clinics around the country, which means it was entering this era, like almost like a 1999 where the web came. So in medicine, right. electronic data is coming, electronic infrastructure is coming. And since 2009, in the last 10 years, 
there's been widespread adoption because of policy changes of this electronic infrastructure. But the use of this data is still extremely limited in healthcare delivery. Like today, the way physicians practice is still the way, you know, uh, practice occurred 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so the singular focus being there are so many opportunities for improving the quality of care. If we could use data in a more intelligent way, correctly using the right type of AI. And so how do we make that happen? Nice. And uh, you kind of jumped directly to your, your recent history, but I noted that you uh, earlier in your career, you uh, interned with Eric Horvitz, who was a recent guest on the show, and you did your PhD with Daphne Kohler, who's been on the show. Uh, you've had some amazing opportunities. Yeah, it's true. Actually, I have a funny story about that. So I didn't actually want to be faculty at all. My thought was I'm going to go into industry and, um, you know, like I love the pace at which industry moves. And I was doing a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, the work we did in neonates, we were able to show by using machine, like approaching this data from a new lens, you really could actually predict outcomes in these little babies which babies at risk for complications much earlier than physicians were recognizing them. Mm -hmm. So um, my, at the time, I remember there, were, there was opportunity to start a company to build, improve neonatal care. And I met, and you know, Eric's been a mentor of mine for a while, and Eric sort of met me at NeurIPS, where he's, he's like, why aren't you becoming faculty, Suchi? And I sat there and I was like, I don't know, things that academia move at just a pace that feels a tad <laughs> bit too slow. And we had this sort of soul searching conversation for like half an hour where you, that got me to like reconsider where I was like, you know, what we're doing is very foundational. I think this was back in 2011, mm -hmm. very, very foundational, the kind of work I was doing back then and realizing like we're very early in our use of, we need novel methodological developments that was really going to unleash this kind of data. Our technology wasn't ready yet at the time, which meant it really needed to be in a very deep research environment, being at a place like Hopkins, right, which is mm -hmm. in a way the mecca of healthcare, like um, you get to sit next to people who are some of the leading policymakers who study, you know, uh, guideline policy change and got treatments and like, uh, so in some sense, it felt like in order to be able to bring about any kind of change, coming to the center of the activity and trying to bring change from within could be really productive. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so that was really exciting and uh, really enjoyed, uh, you know, Daphne and Sridhar. I've had a number of really amazing people who influenced me from a very, very young age. That's awesome. Um, you're you know, often when I'm talking to folks that are applying ML in uh, in the in the medicine and healthcare field, there's like, I guess the, the point I'm getting at is like, there's a distinction, a, you know, there's a set of folks that kind of think of it from a policy perspective and healthcare. And there's a set of folks that think about it from a medicine perspective. Your work seems to span the two. Is, is that true? That's right. So um, I think the way to think about this is almost everything starts with a discovery, right? You want to first figure out, um, you know, what is something, where is there opportunity for change and what would you do differently? So in other words, are you inventing a new software based? So often in machine learning, the kinds of interventions we'd be looking at is like new software based tools for being able to do diagnosis more correctly, new mm -hmm. software based tools for moving, doing early detection of adverse events, new software based tools for targeting drugs more precisely software-based tools to avoid adverse drug effects. So these are all examples of totally new opportunities that machine learning and AI have opened up. And in order to uh, scale any of them, they always start from a discovery phase. So you're learning about, you're using data to identify what's possible. Then you construct, you know, just like you would construct a new drug. Here you would construct a new piece of software. It's just like a drug, happens to be bits and bytes. Mm -hmm. that's using the data to do something differently. You should ideally go through the same exact process of creation, validation, evaluation, showing it works in a prospective setting upon, you know, when used. And once you've done all that, then you move into policy. So when we think about policy, there are two levels of policy. There's sort of at the level of like clinical guidelines, which means societies have to go, there's a whole process in medicine, dissemination of new ideas are, are much more 
uh, rigorous, methodical, I would even say somewhat slow in the sense that you're trying to convince, you know, and you saw this with the vaccines, right? We had to think very hard right. about how is evidence communicated? Because mm -hmm. you can have all the right stats and data supporting something. It still matters how it's disseminated mm -hmm. and through what channels is it dissem disseminated in order to build trust at scale. And so that's sort of where you move into the policy realm, where you are thinking hard about one, uh, like clinical guidelines for a specific new invention, and then at the policy level, also, what is the general mechanism or framework by which these kinds of ideas get absorbed over and over again at scale? Yeah. And then, of course, the implications of that on everyday practice, whether it's cutting costs, improving outcomes, and everything that's needed to uh, accelerate disciplined adoption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. And a big part of that is dealing with the whole pay system uh, here, the payers and the insurance companies. And I was having a conversation with a friend who comes at things from that perspective. He's a, a pharmacist by training. Um, and he noted that, you know, we're just now getting to the point where, um, you know, the first algorithms are getting coded by the insurance companies. Uh, I don't know that world very well, so I'm sure I'm butchering it, but uh, it's taken a long time to, to get to a level of progress where we're, um, where we're yeah. seeing that the kind of impact. Yeah. So actually, Sam, uh, let me unpack that question, because I think there are like a couple of different things you touched on. So the first okay. thing is, why has it taken this long? Mm -hmm. what, what is hard about it? what's taking long? And then the second question is, well, where do we stand now? Yeah. So let's start with like, are, is it taking long? What is taking so long? Why? So, you know, 10 years ago, electronic health records came to be right. And mm -hmm. the digital infrastructure started to be now it turns out the data collected within these and through variables, which means there's been, and COVID's only accelerated this, right? There are you know, now data being collected in digital format through devices, through measurements in the clinic, in a hospital, um, also like any kind of billing data, reimbursement data, like lots of different sources for really building what is kind of like a digital longitudinal picture of a person and how they've, uh, you know, how they've evolved, but also how like different treatments have impacted them, which means now in the last five years, what's been possible is you know, researchers like myself, um, you know, I was sort of relatively early in this movement, but like really going neck deep to understand, head deep to understand like what's hard. Like this data, there are hundreds of different data streams. It's not like imaging data, but you have one type of data. You have hundreds of different data coming in, different kinds of bias, different kinds of missingness. Um, and you're integrating all these data to draw real time clinical signals but these signals have to be much more trustworthy, safe, and precise compared to say if you were just, you know, choosing whether to show somebody the ad for a shoe, right? right. It's like a whole different ball game. And so a big part of this was um, being able to build the kinds of methodology and technology to be able to really draw safe, reliable, trustworthy inferences that could then power specific applications. So that's the first part. Second is then tying it to real concrete use cases that are well supported by clinical users where there's naturally need for it, like hospitals are struggling or providers are struggling. They actually need solutions to help them. As opposed to, you know, often the way technologists start by solving problems is they start with the problems that are technically hard, that they find technically interesting, not and not all of them are technically useful. Sure. So in this case, we want to marry the heart, you know, we had to build the heart technology, but we also had to deeply understand medicine, the practice of medicine to understand where are their use cases where today people are struggling, where there is need, and we can marry the two. And then the third part that is actually really hard. And so I thought we were like almost there back in 2016. And I was like, ah, oh, this is so beautiful. <laughs> we've written all these papers in a number of different use cases. And we've started to show how it's feasible to take the technology and to even get it to a place where it's possible to show how it would be used by providers. But then I realized like, you know, 
there are all these other barriers, like how the technology is delivered within a provider's workflow, like it's user experience. How do they, you know, how will they use it? Is it easy to use? Mm -hmm. And how does it communicate? Like going back to machine learning and AI, one of the super cool things um, in the field in the last couple of years that, uh, you know, our, our lab, uh, my team at Bayesian and then others in the field are, have been thinking about is how do we make machine learning amenable to collaboration with experts, right? So in my example, if, if physicians and nurses and care team members are going to use the software, these are high stakes decisions. We need them to be able to collaborate with the software outputs. It's not like a black box system where the system can just, you know, say something and overrule what the provider is going to do. It's actually, uh, it requires teaming. It requires the ability for uh, the software to identify patients at risk, for the providers to come in and agree, disagree, reason with it. And that means it's a joint decision-making process. And how do you facilitate that with machine learning in high-stakes environments? So that's been, those are the kinds of areas where we need needed to keep pushing the field. And we've been able to make a lot of progress in terms of the quality of the underlying methodological stack to be able to get to really high quality inferences that are trustworthy. Of course, there's always room to improve. And then, you know, in terms of use, like we built and deployed, for example, in sepsis, which is one of the leading causes of inpatient death. I lost my nephew to sepsis. So it's sort of like a personal area that I've been working in for almost now seven years. And in sepsis, for instance, um, you know, timely treatment is one of the most effective ways to improve outcomes. Ba basically, the earlier you can catch a patient, evaluate and give them the right treatment, the more you're likely to completely alter the clinical trajectory. Um, and, um, but, and our very early work back in 2015 showed you could identify sepsis early using machine learning, but getting it to a place where you could identify it, surface it, get providers to use it, adopt it, act off of it, to actually improve outcomes was like a whole five year, six year journey. Mm -hmm. And like, and basically now um, we're, uh, we're recently um, going to release a study that shows, you know, our experience deploying this with thousands of physicians and nurses using it uh, over the course of a uh, two and a half year period where we've been able to see, you know, very meaningful adoption. So like 90% of cases that the software flags, the providers actually go in, look at what the tool has to say, and they provide an evaluation. And then they treat patients if they agree. And, and that's lead to very meaningful shifts in, uh, in terms of in our cohort, what we found is um, in sepsis, every hour is delay is associated with uh, increased risk of uh, in, associated with significant increase in mortality, and we've been able to meet very significantly impact how early are these patients are getting treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's an area that you've worked very closely in. Are you able to give us a sense for more broadly? Um, you know, where are there pockets of success? I mean, you know, we, over the past uh few years or or many years at this point you know we've gone through the waves of oh hey we you know ai can read uh can read x-rays better than radiologists so you know we're done there you know x-rays can identify uh you know cancer and biopsies you know we're done there but you know when you talk to folks in the industry um you know, we're a far, a far way from done. How do we parse? Excellent, excellent, excellent point. So this is so hard as a researcher in the field, because I get to watch those headlines all the time. Mm -hmm. One of the big, big, so it's sort of the innovation has gone through phases. The first phase was hubris. We went in, there were people <laughs> who went in and were like, we can do everything because AI yeah. can do everything and anything. So it can do everything. They underestimated how hard medicine and healthcare is. So that was hubris. Mm -hmm. Then phase two, a renewed pack of researchers who came in wiser and um, went in and really rolled up their sleeves, dug in deep and came up with methods that actually work for this kind of data. Integrating domain knowledge, causal reasoning, thinking about safety, reliability, actionability, that sort of thing. So then the next phase was a sequence of methods that were better, higher quality, which resulted in these kinds of headlines you've seen where they're doing evaluation studies in the lab where they say, okay, let's compare how the software does 
to how a human expert would do either by looking at historically on a population, what the human did and comparing the software in the background or putting them in front of the software and see if they would change their mind. What's new now is phase three, where basically we've gone from experiments in the lab to the kind of example I'm talking about in the last three years where we've now deployed in real life settings where providers are actually using these software and actually making decisions with it. That's been very hard to go come to and it's been a lo you know, long time coming and that's why this is so exciting to be able to get to mm -hmm. a place where we see providers adopting, we see providers in engaging, interacting and actually a changing practice in a meaningful way. So I think this phase three is going to be extremely exciting because we're going to see more and more. So through Bayesian, for example, we, we've uh, applied sort of a platform that we've built, which provides basically these kinds of real time signals to empower providers to catch life threatening complications early to save lives. Mm -hmm. And um, we've done this in a number of different clinical areas. And um, my sense is like, just like we've done it. There are a couple of other, you know, there are other groups around the country now that are also sort of like in imaging some of these early results you saw where people are like, ah, software can do better. In some of these areas, people have already started operationalizing it. So there's this in diabetic retinopathy, which is um, uh, an area where, you know, often early you know, diagnosis is missed because patients go to the prime. And the question was, can we automate the diagnosis or screening of diabetic retinopathy with primary care providers? And so there are groups now that have built software that gets deployed at primary care uh, physician's office that can be used for screening, automated screening. And then if they're at high risk, they're sent to a specialist. So that's Perfect. sort of an example that is already now in widespread use. Um, and, and in terms of billing and coding and reimbursement, which is sort of what you alluded to earlier, that's now starting to happen for some of these treatments. So there are like couple different treatments already where uh, these AI type screening diagnostic workflow based tools where, uh, you know, um, they're getting reimbursed today by either from the health system paying for it itself or the insurance companies paying for it for the use of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that ends up being a big accelerator for uh, innovation in the space is my the impression I'm under. You always have to understand at the end of the day, if you, you can do things to make, you know, this was for me, one of the most rude awakenings. Um, and <laughs> you know, like back in 2011, I, I sort of thought, well, doesn't it make so much sense? We could save lives. Wouldn't that be enough? But the reality is that's not enough. That's the way a provider would see it is, or a physician would see it is there are so many opportunities for saving lives. Mm -hmm. You need to solve more than one problem for me. You need to help me save lives, but you also need me to help me do other things. You need to save me time. You yeah. need to make my job easier. A health system administrator will say, you need to help us cut costs. You need to help us improve our, uh, you know, um, reduce penalties that we get. So this is where deep marriage of the domain and the financial system and how it works. And then marrying that to where the use cases are, where there's real opportunity for adoption near term. And then obviously long-term, this is where policy plays a role again, right? As we see more examples like this, it's not like policy is frozen. There's always opportunity for new policies to get adopted that incentivize the use of these kinds of technologies. So for instance, healthcare historically has been pretty reactive, which means, you know, when a problem happens, you show up, I look at what's happening and I fix it. I think where AI can make a big difference done right is moving it from being reactive to proactive. We can, for, we can look at your data in a granular way. We can forecast. We can make it possible for you to anticipate these complications and act in a timely way. That is pretty exciting. But today, in some scenarios, moving to proactive care might actually reduce the amount uh, systems are getting paid, which mm -hmm. means there's a natural financial barrier to the adoption of these kinds of technologies. That is also changing. This is you know awareness that's coming. People are becoming aware. You know, there are new um, financial models that are coming, uh, you know, uh, new new sets of financial models like bundled payments and value-based care, where there is incentive for systems to be uh, more, uh, more focused on preventative care, proactive care. And that all of that will also mean more opportunities for AI to, to impact uh, lives. Got it. Got it. Um... 
you in kind of describing this phase two, you rattled off a handful of method methodological changes, improvements that have happened over the past few years. Uh, it seems like an interesting area to maybe dig into a little bit deeper um, so that folks, you know, that are thinking about entering the space have some ideas for the, the way that they need to approach problems in the space. Uh, can you elaborate on what some of the big um, you know, differences that you've seen in you know, the way folks need to approach machine learning problems in healthcare nowadays? Yeah. So one of the very, very big differences is um, sort of um, in some of the other areas, there's this notion of like you have really good gold standards and really clear evaluation metrics. So for instance, mm -hmm. you could go into face recognition, say, and maybe there's a very nice data set where everybody sat down and everybody can agree this person is this person and that person is that person. There isn't so much debate about it. And you can, and if your goal is to do face recognition or face detection, the error metric is pretty clear. So you can go in, get a data set, it's well annotated, there isn't a whole lot of disagreement, and you have a clear metric to optimize. And then people can go to town with all the creative ideas for optimizing that metric. There are so many ways in which health data sets are not that. So for example, <laughs> in most clinical areas, the notion of like, what is the gold standard and what is the metric you're optimizing for is very unclear. So, as, so when we first framed the sepsis early, sepsis early detection problem, the question was, well, how early do you want to detect it? Because if it's mm. too early, maybe providers won't recognize it. But right. if it's too late, but then that's not very productive. So that's one example. The second example, okay, what is sepsis? That's an existential question. People will sit <laughs> down and debate, like, this person was treated for sepsis because they likely were septic, but somebody else might say, yeah, but this person was being a bit conservative and treating them. Got so it. what do you do? Do you treat that person as septic or not septic? Or do you treat it? So how do you think about that? Third, you could take data set from one hospital or one health system, and uh, you could learn a model that is very good at predicting there. But as soon, but you know, we've written numerous papers on this topic. Um, like when you move it to a different hospital, if you have these big, rich, deep models that are very flexible, can learn anything, they can easily pick up patterns that are very specific to how people practice in that hospital. When you go to a different hospital, that method may not generalize at all. In fact, there are papers showing, you know, certain methods are very brittle, easily break as you shift the underlying data. Um, and, and you want methods that are robust and to these kinds of shifts. So can we, so we need almost sort of like new class of reliable learning methods or, um, um, you know, uh, shift stable methods. Like they have a number of different names in the field, but basically methods that like, where if there are nuisance things that change in the data, they're not gonna actually impact the quality of the learning system or differently put, up front, you can give guarantees that if certain types of nuisance changes happen, they're not actually going to hurt the software's performance in an unpredictable yeah. way, which is something that's very important in applications like, you know, um, social impact applications, right? Where it's often um, a question of life or death as, as opposed to, say, like advertising, for, um, by contrast. Mm -hmm. I, I could talk about a number of other uh, methodological issues, but, you know, all of these, like, uh, how do you like health data are like so messy, so messy, and there's a lot of missingness. How do you take into account um, the like by tackling the messiness and the uh, missingness and uh, measurement models in an intelligent way? You really can show 200, 300 percent improvements yeah. in precision um, or sensitivity. So, um, so, uh, so I, yeah, actually... I think, yeah. I was actually going to ask about that because in the in the, the setup to all this, you described um, high tech and the introduction of electronic medical records as kind of opening up this um, you know huge opportunity. But uh, I still hear from folks that you know as much as you know we've digitized, uh, the data is still very very messy, very dirty, and that remains a huge constraint uh, in this particular set of applications. 
Um, I'm just curious of there, if you can elaborate on that and what kinds of examples you can give us to help us understand the, the state of, of healthcare data. Yeah. So I think, um, healthcare data is definitely far more messy than any other domain I've ever worked with. Um, the, the way I think about it is there are certain things you can do with it and there are other things you can't do with it which is why it's even more important to have deep expertise in understanding the data, the complexity of the data, but also the problems you're looking to solve with it to understand the risk profile, right? Just like in a drug, there's a notion of risk benefit analysis, right? Almost everything comes with like a some kind of side effect. So how is it getting used on whom? What's the side effect? What's the benefit? And there's a risk benefit trade-off. So in the same vein, in terms of health data sets, there are some applications where today's technology is just not there. There are other applications where today's technology um, isn't there, um, but you could build the right technology to improve it. And there are yet other applications where no amount of amazing technology can help you because the information doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, a, there's um, certainly a number of problems where the information doesn't exist and we just need new modalities. But the vast majority of problems are the kinds of problems where the data exists because today human experts like physicians, nurses, care team members are looking at this data and making decisions, right? So the data exists and there's an opportunity to leverage the data in a much more intelligent way to be able to, so it's all uh, to be able to improve the quality of decision makings and outcomes, right? So it's like a human expert is looking at it. Yeah. And they're making decisions. So whether you like it or not, it's happening. And so now the question is, how amenable are these? And the way, and I think that's where we need the right kind of um, machine learning AI technologies that are, you know, humble. Where like the researchers building these tools are humble. They understand the difficulty of it, and they're intelligently approaching, you know, which problems to tackle, and then doing very careful evaluation. So I, I guess another theme here is evaluation. So because this area is hard and correctness is so crucial, I almost feel like unlike other fields where people spend, you know, 10 units of time, like 90% of the time developing a model and then 10 minutes writing it up. Here it's the flip. It's like whatever time you might spend the model, you need to spend 9x that much more time triangulating in many, many ways to get to a place where you know it works. Yeah. And, and that makes this really hard. So, um, yeah, so I think, I, I think it's very promising. I think the data are exciting. I think there are loads of opportunities. It's just, uh, it requires more patience, more thoughtfulness, more carefulness. Uh, maybe back to methodology. You're, you've named your company Bayesian Health. Uh, you mentioned causality uh, in that list of um, tools. Yeah, talk about the role of causality and and um, maybe by extension the approach that Bayesian is taking. Yeah, so um, when they hear the name Bayesian, they often think, "Oh, is it only using Bayesian methodologies?" Uh -huh. um, so, um, so let me just sort of first quickly explain that, which is um, just like any smart human, when we have a lot of different data coming at us, we integrate it over time to a to update our view of what we think is happening. That's how the best physicians practice, right? They're continuously doing new tests. They're integrating the new piece of information coming in. They're doing uncertainty quantification. They're thinking about how certain and uncertain they are about the different pieces of information coming in and putting it all together to come up with the forecast, which updates as new information arrives. Mm -hmm. That's a very Bayesian way of thinking. So it's that's basically, so the, Bay, the Bayesian health the name comes from the idea of building intelligent software that gives you the ability to do that rigorously with large scale health data. In terms of the kinds of techniques, it's it's really um, a common, you know, so you asked me causal inference. So when we have today for these models to be able to be um, intelligible and actionable, it's so important for it to not capture spurious correlations or spurious dependencies that are almost like hurt the user trust. So in some sense, that's where knowledge of the domain, the data generating process, and as a result, uh, techniques from causal inference are really helpful, 
more more than in in being able to build models that are going to be more intelligible and actionable turns out these models are also more transportable or you know more likely to generalize as you go across sites or across uh, you know even within the same site across time where you know data collection methodologies might change or practice patterns might change and so on and so forth by making models that aren't just learning memorizing what's in the data but it's reasoning mm -hmm. about what if like if this were to happen then what if that were to happen then what i'll give you a simple example there was a really nice um paper uh a, a few years ago where it's a very well-cited paper now where um this team of researchers were trying to learn a model for predicting patients who came in with pneumonia into a hospital emergency department, their risk profile, with the idea that if they were high risk, they would place them in the intensive care unit, which is the sicker unit, or like the high acuity unit, right? Like where the sickest patients go. Yeah. And then if they were lower risk, maybe they would go to the floor. And uh, they took historical data sets and they learned using like, you know, classical supervised learning techniques, a model. Mm -hmm. And what that model did is looked at retrospective data and said, Okay, great. If the patient came in and they died, then that's my training data for high risk. Mm -hmm. If the patient survived, that's my training data for not high risk. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, they learned a model. And then what the model learned was, turns out patients who had pneumonia with asthma were actually lower risk than patients with just pneumonia, which is mm -hmm. uh, for totally counterintuitive because, you know, asthma complicates the case quite a bit. And mm -hmm actually you tend to have poor outcomes. Now, right. when they went and looked in the data, they realized actually the reason that was happening is because the people with pneumonia and asthma were getting escalated to the intensive care unit versus the people with just pneumonia were on the floor. But in the intensive care unit, they were just getting constant monitoring, constant supervision, constant um, care, which meant when you looked at the resulting models, all it was really like it was ignoring the fact that this person had been, you know, like, what if, what the model should have done is, what would it, would this person have been high risk if I didn't send them to the ICU? Right. Would this person be high risk if I went, exactly, you want to do right. counterfactual reasoning. So that's sort of an area where we, you know, very early on, we, you know, started realizing in with health data sets, where you really are trying to reason about a patient's risk profile, you really want to, I mean, this isn't just pertinent to health, this is just pertinent across the board, when you're mm -hmm. looking at any kind of temporal or sequential decision making problem, or decision making problem, you want to ask, you know, under different interventions, what would the trajectory have looked like, so you can basically uh, figure out what's the right thing to do. And the question, therefore, one should be asking when developing these models is, what would this person's risk profile be? had they not been to the ICU, as opposed to what's the risk profile, ignoring what was done to them. Right, right. So that's sort of a very simple example of a place where, um, you know, how machine, like the next gen, the, the types of machine learning uh, approaches we're using embrace causality in order to be able to build more sensical models that are both more accurate, more actionable, but also more transportable and safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that by the time this show is out in the wild and, and folks are listening to it, Bayesian Health will be announced and released. Uh, and as part of that, you're releasing a study. Can you tell us a little bit about the study that you're that will be published by the time folks hear this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're releasing a um, a copy of a manuscript where basically um, starting in April 2018 across five different hospital sites, we built and deployed the software for early detection of sepsis and making it possible for uh, care teams, uh, specifically providers and nursing staff, to be able to get access to these real-time machine learning inferences entirely within the workflow to flag patients who are high risk and then make it possible. And, and so, you know, it, we provided these dynamic workflows within the EMR. So EMR is the electronic medical record. It's the infrastructure, the system they use for documenting, for recording. You know, it's sort of the platform that the, you know, care team, uh, like providers spend the vast majority of the time in. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is provided this um, real-time software that like pulls data in the background in real time, crunches it, 
puts information back into the EMR, into the provider's workflow, flags a patient when they're at risk, makes it very easy for the provider to come in and see why were they flagged, more context around the patient in terms of, uh, you know, what was the risk for certain uh, comorbidities, certain um, uh, uh, certain adverse events, and then also like what are the indicators that they could quickly look at. And um, now they look at it, they evaluate, and then if they agree it's septic, they treat it. And what the study does is analyzes, um, and it's uh, sort of a first study of a kind in the sense that it's large, it's analyzing physician adoption, factors impacting physician adoption, which is really crucial for the purpose of building future CDS tools that have chance of getting increased adoption and also look at, uh, sorry, clinical decision support. So any kind of like AI driven decision mm -hmm. support, decision augmentation tools and its impact on outcomes. And so what we find is one, 89% uh, of the, so it was, a, a, you know, over, upwards of nearly 500,000 patients were screened through the software. Uh, 10,000 cases of sepsis were analyzed. When uh, providers, when the software flagged a patient, 90% um, of the times, or 89% to be precise, providers came in, you know, it was a passive tool, but they sought it out, uh, interacted with it, put in an evaluation. Um, and then we found that basically when providers did that, uh, um, in patients on whom providers came in and entered an evaluation and treated them, a 1.9 hour median difference, like um, so for the, in the median case, 1.9 hour difference in uh, movement and uh, treatment timing. So, and then this obviously has a subsequent impact in terms of uh, reductions in mortality, morbidity, length of stay. Um, this manuscript only talks about impact on clinical treatment practice and the key clinical metrics people care about like time to antibiotics. Um, the next set of manuscripts will release will be more on clinical, also discussing then verifying like the mortality impact, morbidity impact. Mm -hmm. And then one of the interesting things was in sepsis, being able to recognize it precisely is just really, really hard. And like uh, what we were able to see in our study is like with very high sensitivity, we were able to detect cases, but also, um, you know, the va like, uh, you know, like, with 10x higher precision than typically is seen with widely available software, we were able to like help them, you know, like reduce false alerting quite a bit by basically improving the precision, right? So like mm -hmm. in our study, one in three cases were confirmed as septic. And, you know, it's a needle in a haystack problem. Only a small number of cases in a given day get sepsis. So it's really a problem of like, how do we go from 100 cases to the three or four we need to worry about? Yeah. 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 Uh... I'm curious about the adoption side of things. What type or level of engagement did you have with the physicians who were, you know, ultimately gained access to, did they gain access to the tool passively? Were they actively onboarded? What goes into uh, getting a physician on board and what have you learned about that process? Yeah. So actually um, I think, so we very actively onboarded them. When we initially okay. launched it in 2018, it was super funny. Um, we built it. We were like, oh, the paper is here. It shows it works. The data is <laughs> there. We built it. We integrated it. We launched it. And then literally two physicians used it at this particular site. And it was so disheartening because um, I think that was like end of 2017, early 2018. It was sometime around then. I can't remember. Maybe sometime in 2017. It feels like forever ago. But like... I just remember distinctly, like we launched it, we thought it was going to be such a big deal. And it was so sad when we were monitoring the data coming in <laughs> to see literally like nobody was using it or like a small number of people who were deeply involved in the development were using it. Mm -hmm. So we had to do a lot of work to get it from like machine learning researchers and engineers and launching a piece of software to people who understand human machine teaming and collaboration and workflow integration and design and you know like that gap needed to be closed and then part of that is also how you launch the software and in medicine this is really important because it's part of the trust building process yeah. so we basically partnered with champions in local sites to basically create materials that was really easy for them to read um and uh you know gave very and the tool was designed to be very intuitive easy to use and then, uh, and it's very simple, but basically making it so that 
um, we could basically have a little video where they could see, understand how to use it. And then we also had a whole infrastructure for monitoring engagement and adoption, which was super crucial because mm -hmm. if you can monitor, then we could understand like, you know, both in terms of the health of the models itself and how they were working as we scaled across sites, but also like what was use looking like, where there were barriers and how we could mitigate those barriers. Yeah. And so we partnered with our champions to be able to then close barriers for adoption. Right. And in some, and these were very myriad barriers, some around software, some around their perception, some around their understanding. And we took different approaches to closing these barriers uh, based on, you know, what we learned. Awesome. Awesome. Um, maybe to wrap things up, you can share a little bit about where you think the field is headed. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm super, it's, I'm super excited about where I think the next five years will be in this field. I think we're really uh -huh. at a place now where, you know, the data exists, the infrastructure exists, the ability to deliver these inferences within workflow exists and the ability and our experiments and papers show the ability to pop, uh, you know, and providers are willing to engage and they're engaging and we can have meaningful impact on practice. So to me, the next five years is about leveraging this whole stack to apply this thoughtfully in a number of other clinical areas and start doing really thoughtful evaluations. Like one of the very big things that's been missing is because there are no evaluations, people don't know if something is working. And if they don't know something is working, they, they are not gonna adopt it and trust it. And medicine, this is such a key currency for anything. Yeah. So today, a lot of software and medicine, software-based tools, people are just, uh, people deploy it, but they haven't had the infrastructure to really evaluate measure efficacy. Um, but in, you know, as we've sort of worked in this area and I think, um, you know, we've, we've developed infra for monitoring. So to me, the next five years is, is we others in the field release more and more studies showing efficacy that now accelerates adoption, learning around what increases adoption. And then obviously if you have a good quality intervention that is precise and gets adoption, you're going to get outcomes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Suchi, thanks so much for joining us and sharing a bit about what you're up to and congrats on the launch of the company. Um, yeah, it's, it's been great to chat with you. Yeah, likewise, Sam. I'm so glad we finally got to catch up and hopefully the next time we speak a few years from now, I'll have uh, much more good news for you in terms of the number of different clinical areas that are already being impacted by uh, AIML in real time. Fantastic. Thank you.